and I welcome you to the panel discussion titled Imagining Utopia, Will There Ever Be a Disease-Free World? After the pandemic, I think we all can agree that we want that world because it's scary out there. Uh, let me just quickly introduce uh, today's panelist, uh, Mr. Chris Karp. He's the Director, Discovery and Transnational Sciences, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His team's mission is to catalyze catalyze innovation for the discovery and translation of trans transformative solutions to global health and development inequity. An immunologist, infectious diseases specialist and internist, Chris joined the foundation in 2012 as deputy director, vaccines and host pathogen biology. Prior to the foundation, he was on the faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His academic scientific career focused on defining the mechanisms underlying the reg reg regulation and dysregulation of inflammatory responses in infectious, allergic and genetic diseases in children. Mr. Srinath Reddy, he is an honorary distinguished professor at Public Health Foundation of India, PHFI. He is the past president of PHFI and formerly headed the Department of Cardiology at Ames. PHFI is engaged in capacity building in public health in India through education, training, research, policy, development, health, health communication and advocacy. He has been appointed as, as advisor to the government of Odisha, Punjab and Andhra Pradesh. He served as physician to two prime ministers of India. Professor Reddy is member of the government of India, India Technical Task Force for COVID-19 and he also received Padma Bhushan. A third panelist is uh, Gagandeep Kang. She's a microbiologist at CMC, well Lord. Uh, she's an established strong training program for students and young faculty in clinical translational medicine. She's known for her interdisciplinary research studying the transmission, development and prevention of enteric infections in children in India to develop practical approaches to support public health she has built national rotavirus and typhoid surveillance networks, established laboratories to support vaccine trials, and conducted phase one to three clinical trials of vaccines. She is investigating the complex relationships between infection, gut function, and physical and cognitive development, seeking to build a stronger human immunology research in India. She would be joining us soon. Uh, our fourth panelist is Abhay Bang. Uh, he is the Director of Society for Education, Action, Action and Research in Community Health, also Pulse Search, co-founded in 1985 with his wife, Dr. Rani Bang, in a remote district in Maharashtra, where they live, provide medical care and conduct research in 150 villages. They have developed a new approach, home-based newborn and child care, which has reduced the infant mortality rate. He is currently a member of Central Health Council, Government of India, and Chairman of the Expert Committee on Tribal Health, Government of India. Abhay and Rani Bang was recently honoured by the President of India with Padm Shri Award. I would like to request uh, Mr. Reddy to please take the discussion uh, further. Good morning, Adab. It's a pleasure to see an audience which I'm sure the majority of which is going to be living into the 22nd century. So this topic becomes very relevant because they would be wanting not only to live long but live healthy. Even as they age, they want to be fit and functioning, not frail and feeble, without the shadow of disease and disability. And therefore, this particular topic as to whether we will ever have a completely disease-free world, is it an empty dream or a utopia, or is it achievable, is worth considering for the sake of the generations that are growing up now. Well, tremendous strides are being made in biomedical sciences and clinical treatments and therefore there is an understandable excitement 
of how diseases can be prevented, diagnosed, and treated. From RNA interference to CAR T cell therapies, from artificial intelligence led prediction algorithms to regenerative medicine, it appears that we can now deal with diseases more capably than in the future than at present. However, the topic posits that we are actually aiming for a disease-free world, not necessarily a world which is healthy. The WHO's definition of health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. So is the vision for a world free of dreaded disease or a world where health and well-being are viewed as a positive virtue to be promoted across the life course of every person. And that's what I'd like the panel to look at, not only to keep us free of disease, but also to promote health in every dimension. Even in the context of biological threats, like for example the pandemics that we have just, pandemic that we have just witnessed and has sort of uh, grown further, the big challenge of course is going to be, are there more pandemics to come? Not just because microbes have become more malevolent to attack human beings, but because we humans have built conveyor belts for microbial migration from wildlife to captive bred veterinary populations and to human habitat. We are giving them free access and fast travel in order to cause deadly infections. Can we end that? Can we stall the process of climate change and stem its disastrous consequences to human health? These are some of the important questions that we need to ask, definitely. Then we also know the very many determinants of health which extend beyond the biology of persons to their beliefs, behaviors, perceptions, priorities, available pathways of action both at personal level and population level to protect themselves and the levels of development and resource distribution at national and global levels. So when we speak of health, we don't only speak of biology. We speak of the social, economic, environmental, and commercial determinants of health. Can science and technology influence them in favor of health? Can the reach of science extend from cell to society? That is going to be an important element that we need to look at. Can we eliminate ultra-processed foods Tobacco, reduce the dangers of tobacco and alcohol, which are driving the epidemics of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and cancer. Even if we talk of the miracles of modern science, which we must applaud, will personalized medicine and precision public health cross the barriers of proprietary science of patent protected scientific innovations and the profit maximizing medical industry? Can we make the benefits of science available to everybody who needs it without bankrupting them? I believe that science discovers, technology develops, and public health delivers. Can we therefore create a society where there is a multi-sectoral commitment to public health, where everybody in which a se sector of human development are working towards not only a disease-free world, but a healthy free world. So as a public health provocateur, I've raised questions which I hope the panel will like, uh, answer. So may I first move on to Chris and get his perspectives on this. Thank you very much. First of all, let me just say um, how delighted I am to be here and how honored I am to be on stage um, with such amazing people. And I uh, dearly await Gagandeep Kang here. I will say I've made a a, uh, a promise never to be on a panel only with men, so I'm hoping this, this will not happen here. Um, the fundamental premise here, you know, are the current and, and likely future um, frontiers of science and technological uh, innovation by themselves uh, enough to ensure that the future will be disease-free. 
It's a very easy answer. No. Um, what do I mean? There's obviously amazing promise from new technologies, transformational tools, and maybe we'll spend some time on some of them. But of course, that's never enough. Shine, shiny tools on the frontiers of science and technology by themselves do nothing. At the most basic level, without uptake, they have no, they have no impact. And I would say without equitable access and uptake, it's a morally bankrupt enterprise. And of course, building on some of the things that, that you just said, they don't substitute for the basic fundamentals that favor the odds of people having a healthy, satisfying, long life. And this, of course, brings me to those gross inequities that frankly remain ground conditions throughout this world. It's a lack of equitable access to healthy environments, to safe water, to optimal nutrition, to a living wage, that is, the resources for people and their families to have real agency, to good education, to self-determination, to community, to good preventive and primary and specialist care, and to those transformational tools that we're so excited about, to opportunity in general. In my view, too many humans enter and move through the world under unjust and equitable circumstances. And of course, this is much broader than the realm of science and technology. It involves ethics and power and history and politics and economic systems. So a disease-free world or a world where most are able to enjoy healthy, productive lives, welcome. Um, I, I see great promise in the frontiers of technology, and maybe we'll get back to them. But underlying this, you know, there's a huge amount to do with the, with the fundamentals of a healthy start to life. Yes, infant mortality has come down dramatically, but it's still obscenely high. And so maybe we'll start there. And I'll... Thank you. Let me welcome Professor Gagandeep Khan, who has made it. And uh, despite a flight that landed just uh, more than an hour ago and braving Hyderabad traffic, thank you very much for being with us. So I'll pass on the mic now to Abai. Abai, you have been a doyen of public health. You have actually appreciated the ground level realities in Gadcharoli, obviously a very difficult terrain to work with. But you have a broad vision of what science can bring to health. So can we actually assure everybody of a disease-free future? Thank you, Srinath. The audience is here is bipolar and uh, I don't know which pole to address to but uh, the title is very provocative it's an interesting utopian proposition Dr. Anthony Fauci whom we have frequently seen in the media as an advisor to the president of the US recently he retired and he wrote sort of a parting piece in the New England Journal of Medicine in December. It is titled something like, It is Never Over. And then he recounts that in 60s when he went into infectious disease, it was considered to be a field without the future. Vaccines had arrived, antibiotics had arrived, so there were going to be no infections. And we know subsequently HIV came and then COVID and now we are told that we have to learn to live with Corona. So in short, same can be said about this utopian statement. Will there ever be a disease free world? My view is most probably no. Emphatic no. But still, I'll add a qualifier, most probably. You, you don't know what, science, what miracle science will do. But human body is governed by biological limitations. And newer problems will continue to emerge, whether viruses or old age diseases or even mental health problems. As the mobile phones come and mobile phone addiction now there is no vaccine or no drug for the mobile phone addiction. And so we will always have newer and newer challenges. And despite scientific progress, 
which we must all contribute to and appreciate and use to its fullest and yet it's unlikely that there will be ever a disease free world now instead of that utopia probably there is a looming threat of a dystopia and that dystopia is the life expectancy is increasing world over in india it is around 68 years in several other countries it is in 80s so as the life expectancy increases human beings will survive longer with diseases and disabilities so the challenge will be to survive and be functional in spite of having multi morbidities and disabilities dr yuval noah harari in his well known book homo deus does mention about future that the children who are here many of them will be alive maybe 150 years later so the question is not merely of survival but the question will be of surviving in old age with functionality and so such society such human society and japan and many developed countries are already on that threshold they'll need increasing medical support social support and so there is a there is a likely picture of dystopia that we will be in the brave new world of the old people so instead of a disease free world we might look forward to facing a new world of old people with multiple morbidities and this has huge cost implications the united states is currently spending something like 9 to 10000 dollars per capita per year which is around 9 lakh rupees per capita per year for health and mckinsey company presented at the davos conference future projections that with increasing medical technology but also with increasing cost the prediction is that by the year 2100 the us will be spending 97% of its gdp on health an impossibility but that shows the challenge before us if we linearly follow the current medical medical model and with increasing life expectancy financially it seems that it is a impossible picture to sustain and moreover there will be huge dependence medical dependence cost dependence and dependence itself is a disease so in short i don't think that we'll never have a disease free world only the nature of the disease might change from a biological disease to a medical and financial hell of dependence so i'll reframe the question if i'm allowed i'll reframe the question as how to increase health and reduce the disease of dependence for the population as a whole now i don't know shrinath how much time i have or maybe i can speak in second round my utopia you can uh, tie up your argument now okay. and then okay okay my utopia my utopia is that we change the goal post and we say that instead of disease free world we want a world which is swasth now chris is immediately alarmed so let me explain to him what is the word swasth swasth in indian language means health now several decades ago when i returned from the hopkins mahatma gandhi's grandson asked me this question what is the indian definition of health and i blurted out who definition he said what is the indian definition i couldn't and he reminded me the very word swasth has india's definition of health embedded into it jo swa mein sthit hai wo swasth hai one who is autonomous one who is free of dependence 
he is healthy so the very word in india sanskrit word hindi word marathi word for health has inherent in its definition the health indian definition of health is liberation freedom from disease and dependence now how can you achieve it i call that utopia arogya swaraj not medical insurance raj not hospital raj not government raj but arogya swaraj raj arogya swaraj word is borrowed from mahatma gandhi's gram swaraj we instead of that we call arogya swaraj now it will have three elements one control of social determinants already elaborated by shrinath so i won't go into details but as long as air pollution and malnutrition and tobacco and alcohol are rife and there are urbanization problem and rural sanitation problems it is hard to control disease so we need to control social determinants this we, this will have to be done by way of government policies to a large extent by government policies and individual behavior change second our component is empowerment of individuals families and communities for managing their own health by way of health promotion lifestyle change and community empowered empowerment to manage their problem like community health workers asha anms gram panchayat gram sabhas active women's organizations involved in health issues so second component is empowerment and the third component is universal health care because still some people will fall sick they need health care and so there has to be universal health care from primary level to the tertiary level something which i had privilege of working with shrinath to develop such blueprint for india so in short we need social determinant control we need empowerment of individuals and communities and finally we need universal health coverage so the challenge before the scientific community is really how this scientific community will drive the research and policy agenda towards such utopia of arogya swaraj thank you uh, thank you abhay for reminding us that what we must aim for is not just an increase in life expectancy but an increase in healthy life expectancy and the various determinants and actions that need to be undertaken for that professor khan so the problem with turning up late is that everybody is already said everything that needed to be said so well you can say it better <laughs> i can't say it better but i will emphasize that to me if we think about a future world the things to really look at that i think are important one chris referred to equitable access and i think that is critical and i have hope for us because i think that the science and the technology that is being developed now will hopefully narrow the gap that currently exists he is back on top now um how is it um that the world can get together under threat of of a new pandemic which is sweeping the world but doesn't have the same sense of urgency against what i call the residual pandemics tb malaria hiv um why don't why isn't the world pursuing the same kind of accelerated clinical testing and emergency use uh, authorizations for tb again there's there's inequity on many levels here yes we ought to really look at not only public health emergencies in infectious disease pandemics like we have seen just now but also public health emergencies in slow motion whether it is tb or non communicable diseases all of them merit attention uh any other questions uh hi uh good afternoon um i wanted i think we've been speaking uh, about utopia and uh, often times we look at health as a you know the government has to do this or there are bigger bodies out there who should take care of our health 
but I wanted to uh, know from you all uh, if we were to look at this uh, kind of a platform or this kind of an engagement with the public, how do we sort of see uh, public engagement and how can we sort of bring the public into this uh, conversation without it always being the government in power is not doing this or uh, you know AIMS needs to have more uh, hospital beds so how can sort of people come into this conversation and be more of more active participants in this conversation yeah well let me again uh, try and provide a brief answer and let the panelists add more wisdom. I believe we need people-partnered public health. Much greater engagement of people voicing what their needs are, becoming active participants in policy, articulation, program, design, delivery, monitoring, and that can happen at the primary health care level much more effectively than elsewhere. And now the local bodies are being provided resources for primary health care, both panchayats and the urban local bodies. Community-based organizations can play a great role in community mobilization. So people-partnered public health is important. Along with that, we must decentralize as much of decision-making as possible. So digitally enabled, decentralized decision-making at the district level is going to be very important. Countries like Thailand have had um, what have been called village level health assemblies, district level health assemblies, and later on national health assembly every year. Similarly in Brazil, municipal level health assemblies and municipal uh, level participation of public in uh, health decision making and monitoring. So bringing the people is important. But as you said, it is organizations such as this and organizations elsewhere in the civil society who ought to be really enabled to undertake that active engagement and bring people power into play. Uh, Gagandeep, you just had a, for the Lancet Commission, a community engagement uh, session, I think. Yes. Looking at, why don't you tell us about it? Well, before I get to community engagement for the Lancet Commission, uh, you know, to me the question is, when you think about health, who is accountable to us for providing us health, right? In the private healthcare system, we access the private healthcare system and expect it to be accountable to us because we pay for a service. We have no such expectation from the public system, right? Why is that? And that speaks to what Dr. Reddy is talking about. If you were to decentralize the provision of health, through the public health care system, would that then result in there being local accountability for that? We haven't really seen that happen. We are very good at doing this on paper. We are not so good at making sure that people are really empowered to demand a service for which they have directly or indirectly contributed. So I think when we think about what does the public need to do to build a better healthcare system, I think thinking about governance mechanisms, accountability mechanisms becomes important for both public healthcare as well as the healthcare that we get from private services. Now coming to the citizens engagement, that was actually a really interesting exercise. So let me describe this for you. The Lancet Commission on Reimagining India's Healthcare System is something where Dr. Reddy and I are both commissioners. And the idea there was can we contact up to about 50,000 people in India and ask them what their experience is of the healthcare system and what their expectations are of the healthcare system. I've been looking at the early results coming in and it's been actually very interesting because depending on where you are, the answers differ a lot. In places where I expect the population to have absolutely no expectations of the system, they're very happy with it. In places where you think that there is good public health, 
people actually have demands. So I'm beginning to think whether, you know, this is, if you've gotten to a certain standard, you have expectations of more. If you have absolutely nothing, you expect nothing in the future as well. In fact, that happened once uh, before where people in Bihar said they had no major expectations, whereas people in Kerala said they had much higher expectations. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I have not much experience of the educated and urban citizens, but I'll try to address this question from some concrete three examples from rural and tribal communities of Gadchi Rolli. What do people need from healthcare providers? So we organized a people's health assembly. People from 50 villages, their representatives were collected together. And after two days of discussion, they were asked by way of voting to select what they thought was the priority problem. Each member was given three votes. Select your three th priorities. And what they selected became 20 years public health agenda for my organization. People can very wisely point out what their failed needs are. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes or often, their failed needs are better indicator of priorities rather than often set by public health experts. So that's one. We need to ask the people. What do, they, what do you need from health and healthcare? Otherwise, why would they participate? Why would they engage? Usually, people's engagement with the healthcare is only when they fall sick. And sickness usually has an individual experience. Today, I fall sick, somebody else, and he or she engages with the medical profession or the healthcare system. It remains very patchy, sketchy, and disorganized. So, in an organized way, through people's health assemblies, we need to ask the people what are your needs, what are your expectations of healthcare rather than we setting a healthcare agenda and asking people to follow our set agenda. That's what usually happens. Second example. Andhra Pradesh had had experience nearly 25-30 years ago of a huge women's movement to control alcohol. Now for whatever reason, it was not considered a successful one but that was preceded by a similar movement in 1980s in Gadchiruli, women's movement against alcohol. And even 30 years later, people of Gadchiruli have still successfully controlled alcohol in Gadchiruli. Through 1100 gram sabhas, we have been able to control alcohol intake and alcohol sale in Gadchiruli. So again, People engage, especially women engage very actively on the issues, health issues, which affect them, which concern them. So pick up issues which concern them and they very actively participate. Now Gram Panchayat have been given a Gram Panchayat fund for health. 10,000 rupees. Now practically it comes to about 5 to 10 rupees per capita. About 1% of the total public health expenditure, the power of determination is given to the Gram Panchayat. Can we expect really people to take any lead, something which is such an impoverished kind of budget? So we need to at least really allocate 20% of the public health budget to the local bodies, Gram Sabhas, Gram Panchayat, municipalities then only people will very actively engage in health issues because they will consider it worthwhile engaging. Otherwise, for 10 rupees, who is going to engage on the health issues? So these are few examples, concrete examples, where you can get public engagement on the issues of priority of the people and not of the experts. Thank you. Uh, Chris said he had nothing to offer on this particular subject, so I am going to throw him a question which is on the flip side. Now, citizen engagement can sometimes get distorted because the way social media is being exploited for fake news. So, 
what appears to be the voice of the people actually represents the voice of some sections who do not necessarily view science as an advantage or an asset. And that sometimes can drown out the other voices or expectations of the people on the ground. How do we handle this in this new age? I think I can describe the problem better than come up with any solutions, frankly. I mean, um, I think we're all looking with great alarm at a growing anti-science and um, the spearhead of it in, in parts of the world are anti-vaccine uh, misinformation movements. Um, one thing is that this is often, as you point out, not in good faith. This is, again, a question of political power. Um, I don't have solutions, but I must say, as somebody who spends um, their time working on exploiting science um, for novel solutions to health problems, um, this is one of the headwinds that I see um, uh, that is very, very disturbing. Uh, the solution would be probably to engage much more closely with people, use trusted communicators, especially in primary care settings where people already have the confidence in the local healthcare providers, and constantly get their own feedback rather than leave the field open uh, to some people who want to exploit uh, the m medium of uh, uh, social media for uh, their own purposes. But the idea is that we need to get more voices heard, propounding the right scientific message, not necessarily coming up with too many contradictory messages which confuse people, uh, uh, and de-jargonize it, communicate with clarity, but keep the people constantly engaged and interested. And perhaps that is what uh, organizations like this ought to be doing. I think we are... Oh, yeah, right. Uh, we have exhausted the clemency of the clock and the tyranny of the timekeepers takes over. So we close this session. Thank you. No, know, I, I was not uh, planning. One, okay. question, one last question, Dr. Reddy, I have. See, uh, uh, once I drove in a state in one day, in about uh, 12 to 14 hours, and went to 32 primary health centers, cutting across seven districts in one day. And we found that in only four of them, Doctors were present in, in out of 30, uh, uh, as many primary health centers, in 32 of them. Only 16 of them had one nurse each. Rest of them were uh, totally managed by paramedic staff. So, you know, from a, through a prism of timelessness, we'll keep blaming the system that, you know, smaller t towns and villages uh, or, uh, you know, they don't have the quality of social infrastructure for doctors to live there and educate their children and so on and so forth, you know. Do you think a time has come where India should seriously look at a concept like China tried to, to, to a limited ex uh, extent the barefoot doctors, where sons of the soil or sons of the daughters are picked up after class 12 and instead of a full MBBS, they do a three-year diploma kind of a thing and just which equips them enough to take care of 90% of the healthcare needs at a primary health centers. So those guys will have all the incentives to live there in, in, in smaller towns or kasbas or villages vis-a-vis -vis if we expect, uh, you know, MBBS and MDs, you know, to change their lifestyle and, and live in, uh, you know, these uh, remote areas, which, which still in our country continue, continue to be of very, very poor quality by way of social infrastructure. Do you think the time has come to consider something like a barefoot doctor in India? Well, the time has certainly come and this message has gone strongly through. Uh, in fact, beyond the barefoot doctor, now we have the advantage of technology as well. So technology-enabled frontline healthcare providers are going to be absolutely needed. We don't have to be entirely doctor-dependent for all of our services, especially in primary care. This particular model has been proposed several times. In fact, in Chhattisgarh, they had a three-year program, which later on was discontinued because the organized medical sector quarreled about the designation of these people. Assam has continued to some extent, but again, not with great... Uh, level of uh, scaling up, but in the 2011 report that we submitted to the then uh, Planning Commission, Abhay and I were members, we did ask for the three-year program, uh, we called them community 
health officers or community health assistants, whatever you want to call them. And, and this particular thing has been reiterated again in the national health policy of 2017. Repeatedly, Niti Aayog member VK Paul has been advocating it in public fora. But given the fact that, and in fact, even in the 2018 budget, Mr. Jaitley mentioned it. But despite that, it is the reluctance of the organized medical system in states that has been blocking it. We'll have to try and see how to overcome that. And again, people need to articulate the need very strongly. But they, people are capable. Just to give you one instance, auxiliary nurse midwives, not even the three-year trained community health assistants, trained to handle handheld devices with decision support systems built into it, managed over an 18-month period in Himachal Pradesh, it is a study done by my colleagues, to control hypertension and diabetes with 15 millimeters reduction in systolic blood pressure and 50 milligrams percent reduction in blood sugar. This is published internationally. So we have shown the capability. It needs to be scaled up, but we need to overcome the resistance from the organized medical sector. I, I do not know what the signals for time are. We have sort of come to the close. Thank you. Uh, let me thank all the panelists and for the questions that have come from the floor. I'm sure there's a lot to discuss, but uh, in terms of the ut utopia that we are chasing, I think we can do a lot more to make it, if not entirely achievable, a lot closer to reality. Yeah, I think instead of aiming for a disease-free world, we should aim for a swasth world, as Dr. Abhay correctly said, a healthy world. So I would like to really thank all the panelists for such an interesting discussion and the audience for such interesting questions. Thank you.